We welcome, O oh God, your Holy Spirit in this holy place. May it move now in us and among us and through us. Open up inside of each and every one of us a willingness to receive your will and your word for our life. For it's in your name we now pray. Amen. One of my favorite memories from elementary school was when I was in first or second grade at Whittier Elementary School here in Lawton. We had a thing every Friday called Pickle and Popcorn Day. And it was something as a kid that I looked forward to so much. I always wanted to have a pickle and a bag of popcorn. You had to have both. You didn't want to go with just one. You had to have both. And I remember one day, my mom had just dropped me off at my grandma's house like she did every day before I went to school. And as soon as my gr mom dropped me off, I realized I forgot to ask my mom for a dollar. Because each one cost 50 cents. And I was just, as a first, second grader, I was stewing about it, you know, beating myself up. I can't believe I forgot to ask my mom for my dollar, and I just didn't know what to do. And then it finally dawned on me. My grandma went into the bathroom one last time to do her hair before she took me to school. And then right after she went into the bathroom and shut the door, I went into the couch, unzipped her purse, reached in to see what the first green thing I could find, and pulled out a 20. I was in high heaven. I was set. I could have pickle and popcorn out the wazoo. And so I took that 20 and stuffed it in my pocket, zipped her purse back, and just sat there right beside it. She came out. We went to school that day. And right before school got out, we got to go get pickle and popcorn. And I bought myself a pickle and popcorn. I bought my friends pickles and popcorn. I was, I was buying everybody pickle and popcorn. But you know, it was one of those things there's sometimes in life when we find something that we really, really want or that we really, really desire, sometimes we would give anything or do anything to achieve it. Maybe you want to make a good grade in a class. And so sometimes we're tempted to cheat. Sometimes we're tempted to write answers on our hand or we're try tempted to put it in our phones or to cheat off of somebody else just so that we can achieve the grade that we desire for a class. Or maybe we want to get a better position in the job that we have, and so we spend long hours going in early, staying late, to achieve a certain living that we want. Or maybe it's just to be loved or wanted. Maybe we have that dream car that we've always thought about since high school, and so we go and we get a loan that we can't even afford to purchase a car that we're going to default on. We all have things in our life that we desire. And one of our human conditions is the fact that sometimes we will do anything and everything to make sure that those desires come true. And that's where we walk into this story today. We see the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Now, the back story is Joseph was a brother of 12, and his brother sold him off into slavery. And then he got sold from there. He got sold to Potiphar. And Potiphar had him. And no matter what happened in Joseph's life, he just did excelled at it. Everything he touched multiplied. And so if he got put in, in charge of animals, they got more animals. If they got put in charge of money, they got more money. And Potiphar began to see this. And Potiphar said, I want you to be in charge of my whole entire household. Everything I have, I want you to be in charge of it. Because Potiphar may not have been an Israelite and may not have worshipped God, but he saw the fact that God worked through Joseph. And he realized that and wanted to take every advantage he could to have Joseph continue to increase everything that Potiphar had. And so we see in this story that Joseph is there and in charge of everything, and the story tells us that Potiphar's wife began to have an eye for him that she began to look upon him and desire him. And the desire inside of her burned so much that the scripture says that she came to him day and day, day after day, just constantly, every single day, she would come up to him and she said, come and lie with me, come sleep with me. And Joseph would say, no, no, I'm not going to do it. Now, I don't know about you, but there are strong days we have strong days when it's easier for us to resist temptation, but there are also weaker days, days when it's harder for us to resist temptation that comes our way. 
And it's interesting that the scripture says that day after day, Potiphar's wife came to Joseph and said, sleep with me. And you know, sometimes it had to be easy for Joseph to say, no, I can't do that. But you know, there are probably other days when there was just probably a thought in his mind, well, maybe, but he still said no. And it's interesting that scripture pulls out one specific day to talk about. And it's a day like any other day. Because this day it says, no one else was in the house. Now why would scripture say that no one else was in the house? It's because this was the most tempting day of all. Before any time Potiphar's wife had come to him, there were other people in the house, servants were in the house. But this time it says that no one was in the house but the two of them. And she came to him again and she says, lie with me. And in that moment, when temptation hit, he says, I can't. I can't do this because your husband trusts me so much. Your husband has made me an equal with him. He's given me charge over all this stuff. The only thing that I cannot have that he has is you. And if I were to do this, I would sin against God. Now, do you notice that he doesn't say, I would sin against your husband? He said, I would sin against God. Because in that moment, when Joseph was deeply tempted, when it was just the two of them standing there, and no one would have known, Joseph said, I can't. I can't because I would sin against my God. And God told me I can't do these things. And in that moment, Joseph talked himself out of it. What would it be like if you and I did that? What would it be like if we were sitting in class and we needed to make an A on this test because our grade was hinging on it and we were so tempted to cheat but we stopped ourselves and we said, I can't do that. What would it be like for me in the first grade if I would have went to my grandma's purse, started to unzip and said, ah, stop, I, I just can't do that because what if my grandma needed that $20 today? What if that $20 was meant for something specific? Or if I would have said, your grandma's your Sunday school teacher and she told you last week that God says no, you can't steal. And I would have walked myself away from it. What would it have been like if that would have happened? What's interesting in this story is it says in that moment when Joseph says no for that last time, it says that Potiphar's wife grabbed his cloak. Now the word in Hebrew is tapas. And tapas means to lay hold of or to grasp like you're wielding a sword. Now if you grab a hold of a sword, you don't want to let go. Because if you have a loose grip, it's going to fly. But it says that she grabbed it so tightly that she did not want to let go of his cloak. Now one of the things we need to know about that cloak, the word that the Hebrew uses right there, does not mean a coat or a jacket. It means his undergarments. So he had gone into the house that day with an intention. He had been broken down. He was about ready to do it. But then he had that last second revelation and he said, no, I can't do this. I'm going to sin against God. But it says she grabbed it and he ran from it and he ran out of the house naked. But the truth is he did not run out of the house naked. Joseph ran out of the, of the house clothed in integrity. That's what Joseph took with him was integrity when he left that house. Because he knew who God was in his life and he knew that he did not, did not want to mess that up. And so he left the house, ran out of the house with integrity still intact. But you know, this story has a weird ending. Because one of the things you may not know about Potiphar is Potiphar had a nickname. In the community in which he lived, Potiphar had a nickname, and it was called the Butcher. That's what Potiphar was known for, the Butcher. Can you guess why? He loved to behead people. 
That's what he did. He loved to sentence people to execution. He loved to see people be beheaded. And here we have it, because as soon as this happens, as soon as Joseph runs out and, his, and Mrs. P is left there with a cloak in her hand, she runs and finds all of her servants and she says, look, look what he did. He tried to rape me. And then she runs to her husband and says, that Israelite that you brought into our house, he tried to laugh at me and he tried to make a joke of me and he tried to rape me. You did this. And it says that Potiphar got angry, but he did not sentence Joseph to death. Instead, he sentenced Joseph to prison. Not the normal prison. He sentenced Joseph to his own prison, the prison of the palace, the royal prison where dignitaries were held when they had broken offenses. And so it's interesting that even in what Joseph was accused of doing, Potiphar, in a way, didn't even believe his wife as to what actually happened. And we see that God continued and remained with Joseph because from there, while he was in prison, he still had God's favor, and the the head jail person began to use him to do other things, and he began to take charge of this and take charge of this until eventually he became right under Pharaoh working for Pharaoh. God continued to work in Joseph's life. But we have to ask, so what can we learn from Joseph and Potiphar's wife? What can we learn and garnish from this story? I think the first thing, the most important thing, is that we see Joseph right there in the midst of temptation. He called out loud. He named what would happen if he succumbed to that temptation. I can't do this because, one, your husband trusts me, but most importantly, it's because I am going to sin against God. I cannot do that. Think about in our own lives, when you and I are tempted to do something, it's usually after we've committed that tem- given in to that temptation, then we recite in our head, we shouldn't have done this because X, Y, Z. But what would it have been like if we stopped before, like Joseph, and recite those things to us then in that moment? How much more likely are we at that moment to step away from that temptation rather than living into that temptation? And that's something that we can learn from Joseph. Joseph, in the heat of that temptation, before he fully gave into it, stopped himself and he said, I can't. I can't do this. Most of all, because I don't want to sin against my God. The second thing that we can learn from this story is that God is always with us. When Joseph was a boy and being sold into slavery by his brothers, God was with him. God was with him whenever he was sold to Potiphar. God was with him in the midst of temptation when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him. God was with Joseph whenever he was put into prison and then his next stage and next stage all the way through until he saves his family at the end of the story. God was with Joseph through thick and thin. God was with Joseph in the good times and in the bad times. And it's because God was with him and Joseph understood the fact that I cannot sin against God. God is always with me. That Joseph was able to make the right decision. You and I are tempted every day. There are things in our life that we have such a desire to achieve. But what would it be like if we stopped ourselves and realized that, you know, if I cheat on this test, I might get kicked out of school? What would it be like if we stopped ourselves right before we made a loan on a car we couldn't pay because we realized, I'm not only going to be upside down in this car, but they're going to start garnishing my wages and other things like that. I'm going to hurt myself and my family. What would it be like if we realized that we were working so many hours to achieve a certain prestige in our job or to get to a certain point that we realized that I'm hurting my children and my spouse? And I don't want to do that. 
but we walked ourselves away from it, realizing that we did not want to jeopardize those things around us that we cared about, but above all, we did not want to sin against God. We all have that struggle at some point in our life. Sometimes it's small things, sometimes it's big things. But we always have to come down to a judgment, a personal decision in each of our lives. Do we stand as Joseph and call out the truth? Or are we like Potiphar's wife, who even in the midst of temptation, when it kept running from her, she grabbed onto it as to not ever let go of it? We don't know what happened to Potiphar's wife in the end. If you read Jewish books, it tells you there's lots of stories out there about the end of Potiphar's wife. But what we know is that God was with Joseph, and Joseph made the right decision. And God is with you, and God will help you and enable you to make that right decision as well. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.